I don't know about YouTube, though. We are also on YouTube right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We can see. Yeah, başladı mı Bahar Hanım? Şu an başlattım. No, we lost your audio, I guess. Yes. Yes, I don't hear you. I think this is what I have to do. Do you hear me now? Yes. yes. This is what I will have to do. Okay. No headphones. Um, okay. <clears throat> now I'm, you can hear me, right? Okay. So we can start. Um, thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, with the, it, it's my, actually, I was, I, I'm the technical, technical moderator and I had the problem myself. Uh, I would like to, uh, need, sorry, uh, Türkçe konuşmam gerekiyordu, özür dilerim. Um, e, küçük bir teknik sorun yaşadık, e, biraz geç başladık, kusura bakmayınız. E, küçük bir teknik bilgilendirme yapmak istiyorum. E, sağ tarafta bir chat box'ımız var biliyorsunuz, oradan e, yorumlarınızı yazabilirsiniz. Biz chat box'ı açık tutuyoruz. E, daha canlı, katılımcı bir konuşma gerçekleştirmek amacıyla. Fakat aynı zamanda ekranın altında bir Q&A kısmı var. Asıl sorularınızı oradan sormanızı rica edeceğiz ki chat box içerisinde karışmasın, kaybolmasın. Sorularımızı orada biriktirip daha sonra yanıtlıyor olacağız. Bu oturum aynı zamanda e, İngilizceden Türkçe'ye çevrilecek. Bu çeviri içinde yine aşağıda bir e, interpretation e, kısmı var. Ekranlarınızda görünüyor olmalı. Oraya tıkladığınızda Korece'yi tıklarsanız eğer e, Türkçe dinleyebilirsiniz. E, bu da sanırım e, bu Zoom webinarın azizliği. E, Korece'yi tıkladığınızda e, Türkçe olarak e, dinleyebileceksiniz. Bir küçük hatırlatma daha yapacağım. E, canlı yayındayız. Youtube'da yayınlanıyoruz e, şu anda. Bu bilgiyi vereyim. Daha sonra da kayıt olarak Youtube kanalımızda izleyebilirsiniz. E, bir bilgi daha e, Zoom e, ve, webinar kullanıyoruz. E, Zoom webinarda e, Spotlight dediğimiz bazen iki kişi, bazen tek kişi görüntünün olabilmesi için e, zoom'unuzu update etmeniz e, gerekiyor. Son sürümünde böyle bir şey e, mevcut. Fakat YouTube'da e, bu ikili üçlü görüntüler gerçekleşmiyor. Fakat updated bir zoom ile e, bu görüntüyü sağlayabilirsiniz e, deyip e, ben artık e, oturumu e, Daniel Savaslı'ya vermeden önce yine tekrar ben başlayacağım ve Valerio Giorgio ile görüşeceğim ve İngilizce konuşmaya başlayacağım. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, it's it's interesting. So in speaking in Turkish, I was the the technical that was the technical part. In English, I'm acting like the design coordinator and thanking Valerio for the second time supporting the design Izmir. And uh, we are very happy about it. And uh, our mayor Tunç Soyer wrote about it. I don't know if you saw it in Twitter. We are really uh, happy. And actually, uh, yesterday I got uh, uh, somebody said hi to you, which was Özlem Yalım, the journalist. We were in her program uh, last night, and uh, she was also again happy to see you supporting Izmir uh, Good Design Days. And um, thank you again. And I hope uh, this will go on with the consulate. So um, now I would like you to give you the stage and I'm going to make you spotlight. Okay. Uh, dear Elif Kojabik, uh, yeah, Akdeniz Academy Z, dear Daniele Savasta, Yashar uh, University Z, dear Alessandro Ludovico, Southampton University, Winchester School of Art, dear guests, Thank you very much for inviting me today to the opening of this afternoon webinar in the framework of Yasmir Good Design. 
I'm happy and honored that Italy is a partner in the most important design event in Izmir for the second time. This particular year, as the global pandemic is changing our lives and our relationships with each other, also in a city that has been affected by a terrible earthquake, I'm happy that Izmir Good Design Days is taking place. With an interesting team, common futures. I think it's the question that we should all be asking ourselves. What is our common future and how will we shape it? This year, the Consulate of Italy in Izmir has invited Alessandro Ludovico, an academic, researcher, artist, new media expert, and editor-in-chief for Neural Magazine since 1993. He has written several books, including Post-Digital Print, The Mutation of Publishing since 1894, which has been translated also in Italian, French, and Korean. He will be our keynote speaker talking about designing networks for sustainable cultural infrastructure, neural magazine, and temporary library. I will leave him the, to tell you more about this, his experience and work during these years. I would like to focus on the team chosen for 2020 that is, as I mentioned, extremely relevant in light of the circumstances we are facing this year. And why listening today from an Italian designer could be an opportunity for all of us. The skills of Italian designers have the power to imagine a future in, we, in which, thanks to beauty and innovation, a genuinely sustainable development path can be undertaken. It is a testament to how much incentiveness and the need to communicate experiences can prevail over every obstacle, giving reasons for sharing and for hope, which are very much needed at a time like this one. I'm also happy that ISME would like to play an important role in this regard in the, and further. I think that design can be a useful tool, not only in classical areas such, such as design industry. I think the key issue is not anymore how to design new beautiful piece of furniture, even though design is still vital for any company who doesn't want to lose uh, market share, but how digital experimentation and Italian experience in digital design can be at the forefront of the challenges we have to face. Food, fashion, furniture are still the triad that afford Italy its international recognition. But nowadays, design is not anymore about the designer, but about all the people who come into contact with design innovation and product. For instance, Salone del Mobile, which is uh, held every year in Milan, is no longer trade for fair, a trade fair for operators, but a real cultural event that involves an entire city, transforming entire districts, showcasing products, but also creating space for experimentations above all. The pertinence of certain solutions as proof of Italian excellence is now the perimeter for imagination, experimentation, and innovation. Confrontation on the same stage, I think, is a way to enrich each other's experiences in a truly international environment. This leads me to think that the future is the only time zone we can influence. And design is a tool in shaping the future. The intentions and values of design are going to be increasingly important in determining a sustainable way of living. But sustainability is not only being environmental friendly, it means sharing, collaborating, and working together in economics, welfare, globalization, justice, and communication. Italy and Turkey already share their geography, common values, way of living, and protection of the nature that generates the product of our nurture. In a broader way, all the Mediterranean is not only a common past, a common history, or a common culture, but also common futures. We need to work for our common land and sea, for common networks, to face common challenges, to face together common challenges. We are used to imagine Mediterranean countries as dynamic and vibrant places. This, I think, can still be true only if through design and culture in general, 
we will share spaces and moments of community. We have at our disposal all the new tools and digital instruments and networks to transform our tradition and make our civilizations sustainable through shared values. The Mediterranean is many seas and many civilizations. But in final, I want to highlight that together we can also create a common future for it. Design nowadays is one of the most valuable ways through which we can achieve this goal. I really wanted just to say these words. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Really, uh, this theme of this year makes me think so much about what have we achieved in the past as common area, but also how we want to shape our future. And design is the tool, it's not just anymore doing a nice a nice chair or a nice textile. We need to shape our, uh, our spaces. And this is our, I think our challenges in the next years. So thank you very much. I'm really happy that Italy and Izmir are so close on these uh, subjects. I don't want to take uh, space anymore. I'm not an expert, unfortunately. Uh, I want to give the floor to Alessandro and Daniele uh, for anything I'm here. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say one word about this. The way you write uh, and uh, talk, uh, we always want to even involve you in the group, uh, Valerio, really. I mean, you study very good and I think you contribute a lot yourself just by making these speeches. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm always happy. So, um, hello everybody, hello to the participants, um, to the attendees. Um, thank you, um, Elif, for uh, starting the day, for organizing uh, the event. Thanks to the whole organization uh, of the Good Design Days. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Valerio Giorgio, the Consul um, of Italy in Izmir. Uh, as you see, and as Elif anticipated me, uh, his contribution is uh, not only the participation uh, and uh, making us have uh, Italian uh, guests uh, of importance uh, as uh, Alessandro Ludovico this year, um, but also his uh, personal uh, contribution um, by being uh, very close actually uh, and um, really actively joining the, uh, the discussion. Uh, in fact, he anticipated uh, many of the things that I would have liked to say, uh, even the introduction of uh, Alessandro Ludovico, uh, who I can uh, briefly repeat. Um, so uh, he's uh, um, a researcher, artist, and uh, chief editor of Neural Magazine, uh, which uh, the subject of Neural Magazine is gonna be explored today in his uh, talk. Uh, I repeat, the title of the talk is going to be uh, Designing Networks for Sustainable Cultural Infrastructure, Neural Magazine and Temporary Libraries. So we will explore two cases uh, today um, through his uh, presentation. And I think it's uh, very uh, important uh, what also the Consul Valerio Giorgio was uh, saying about uh, expanding the uh, understanding of uh, design. I think this year, um, Good Design Days expanded uh, itself in several ways. One of them uh, I want to mention is the uh, Mediterranean Networks, um, which is a um, part of this event and uh, has uh, other uh, guests you can uh, follow up from the um, program. Um, um, so that one direction and the other direction is exactly uh, when we refer to Italy uh, generally, even in Italy, but also outside Italy, the idea of design is uh, generally around uh, furniture, fashion, and food. And Alessandro Ludovico is um, an exception uh, in the sense that uh, he founded uh, Nero Magazine in 1993 from Bari, from the south of uh, Italy, uh, something that is um, on the uh, edge, let's say, uh, of uh, research. So that's uh, definitely something uh, 
as an expansion. So having uh, him here uh, today in the design week is also an extension in terms of uh, how uh, other field of design uh, exceeding uh, furniture uh, can be uh, part uh, of, uh, of this event and can be part of what uh, also Italian design uh, is uh, seen as. Um, and um, the other aspect is in terms of uh, obviously the subject, uh, common future. Uh, so like the idea of uh, looking at the future is a critical and needs a critical uh, eye, a critical perspective um, in order to, uh, as uh, Valerio Giorgio was saying, um, act as uh, uh, using design as a tool. Uh, so if we don't see it in a critical uh, perspective that could be also a very dangerous, uh, let's say, uh, way. And I think Alessandro Ludovico, uh, with his work, uh, shows exactly how, how uh, critical uh, aspects can be uh, un unveiling uh, our uh, future and our present as well. Um, so I would just let now uh, Alessandro speak. I think uh, he will. Um, explore these two cases uh, in depth. And uh, if uh, anybody has uh, any question, as Alif mentioned, there is the Q&A open. So we will have um, his presentation right now. And uh, at the conclusion, we will have a Q&A. So please um, participate in that aspect as well. I'll be uh, here uh, listening and enjoying uh, with you. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's my, my uh, turn to thank you everybody. Um, of course, uh, Dani Reif and the whole organization uh, of um, a Good Design, um, uh, Izmir. But I would especially, of course, thank Vario Giorgio, uh, our consul in Izmir, for supporting my participation. And uh, uh, while I'm uh, uh, starting to share uh, the, the, the, the slides that I would like to uh, be part uh, of my presentation, uh, I would like to underline how um, actually uh, what uh, Valerio was saying, uh, I think was particularly important. Uh, uh, when he was mentioning uh, uh, the, the role of design and how it, it, it starts to, which was also remarked by Daniela later, how it starts to be something uh, uh, that expands what we are used to uh, consider. And I would particularly um, remark that the, the design of processes uh, is extremely important at the moment. And it joins also the values that Valerio was mentioning, values of sharing uh, and uh, uh, to uh, build together um, uh, possible uh, collabor collaborative infrastructures, uh, cultural infrastructures. Okay, this is the title, you have already uh, heard about it. Uh, thanks for the lovely introductions by both. I'm, uh, again, I'm particularly honored to be supported by uh, my country's consulate. Uh, and uh, I would just like to add that in, in Winchester, I'm also part of this research group. I'm mainly part of this research group, which is called AMT, Archaeo the Archaeology of Media and Technology Research Group. To give you quickly a, a, a visual, um, uh, a visual uh, uh, take about uh, Nero, on the left you can see the very first issue uh, in November 1993. It was uh, uh, printed in Italian. It has been printed in Italian for 10 years and for the latest, uh, for the last 17, it has been instead printed in English and internationally uh, distributed. Uh, about neural, uh, what I wanted, or, I mean, uh, let me just share that we, we didn't uh, did it on purpose, but actually uh, it's quite uh, uh, funny that we picked up a term that can be pronounced in different languages. Uh, so for us, it was neural. 
uh, in Italian, uh, with Italian, uh, let's say, uh, way of pronouncing it. But of course, it's neural in English and in German could be neural, uh, but it, it adapted to different cultures already. So it, it, I, I like to think that there was already an international um, uh, spirit or, uh, within the project without us uh, uh, being perfectly aware of it. On the right, as I said, you can see the last issue, but this long trajectory of 27 years, uh, uh, actually, uh, I, I started to analyze it lately, and I think that it's very based uh, on something that we were uh, mentioning here and there, uh, that you were mentioning here and there uh, in the introductions, but I would like to uh, explore a little bit more precisely, which is the networks. I think the Nero has been possible because of, there have been quite a few supportive networks that have been uh, made it possible, actually. So I would like to have a, a quick theoretical uh, introduction to how uh, networks uh, have been conceived to what we uh, started to think as the substance of networks. So the first part uh, is trying to briefly analyze this substance. So undoubtedly, it, it, it's quite uh, assumed that we live in a space of networks. We definitely do that. Uh, these networks uh, manifest themselves continuously, not only uh, from uh, through uh, our smartphone, but through every possible connected uh, device, uh, every screen among the many that we recurrently uh, consult or that we casually stare at, also the ones that we see uh, uh, on the street, of course, uh, but not only the screens, but also the devices that we uh, that are regulating um, our um, quite a an increasingly part of our life. That's why the offline condition, the condition of being, of being cut off the networks, uh, is, uh, I mean, we have reached this point where the offline condition is perceived as a malfunctioning. I mean, just yesterday, we had a, a quite uh, uh, spectacular, in, in, in the worst sense, unfortunately, uh, malfunctioning of uh, quite three of the major services of Google, which were made immediately uh, their own way on major media. Uh, and uh, beyond the news, which was, of course, affecting a lot of people, I th the, com the comments I was able to see on social media, uh, some of them were interesting about uh, uh, rethinking how much we rely on these uh, physical, technical networks. So it's not only a technical condition, but especially a cultural condition. And of course, uh, the acknowledged and perceived presence of network, we have this perceived presence, um, is infrastructural. And it's built by a restricted number of telecom corporations and mostly, uh, we can say, relying by a, on a handful of global online corporations. And these two groups together are predominantly determining the shape of these networks in both their infrastructure and services. But if we go back for a minute uh, to the uh, definition, trying to make a definition of network, which is not strictly technical, we can uh, easily uh, say that uh, uh, network depends on various scientific, uh, scientific disciplines and also on cultural domains networks refer to. So we can fairly say that the networks are mostly made of elements, nodes, or subunits, which are connected as a whole. And we can think about it immediately technically. So the, the, uh, all the nodes are the, the, the, the servers we connect to when we uh, connect our devices, uh, the subunits uh, and the different elements that constitute the network. But especially we think that we are all together connected. So this a whole that is present. And this whole particularly defines what we might call 
the total network space. Not only that, it also defines its dynamic potential variations in size and shapes. So, uh, I mean, every time uh, uh, people disconnect from the network, we can imagine that the shape of network changes. But if also, if we think about our own network, like just the, the amount of people that are connected, we have constant uh, exchanges through social media, we can think about how our own network changes its size and shape depending on who is connected and who is not, which is also posing uh, uh, the question of transparency versus opaqueness. So the number of involved nodes are determining the scale and complexity of the networks. Still, they are not the only strategic elements in contemporary networks. One of the most relevant is certainly the transparency or on the contrary, the opaqueness of networks. The nodes we mostly use now, as well as our devices are highly opaque. Nonetheless, given that each node is individual, there remains an autonomous capacity to conceptually redefine networks through the creation of sub or separated networks at will. And in this respect, it would be interesting to extract the use and the essence or substance of these networks. Where is it? It lies in the possible relationship that is conceivable through this network abstraction. And it's something that we have tried to experience with Neuro. We will come back to that in a minute. From this experience stems the theory of applying the model, the network the model to human relationships and even to everyday practices, even to our own networks. Networks as collaborative and supportive infrastructure since we live in networks, as I was mentioning in the beginning, we should choose to build and use our networks independently. We can even rely on a kind of, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, there's a scientific theory about the six degrees of separation. So they, uh, um, two, whatever you pick up two human beings, uh, they could be connected by six persons uh, that know each other, it's its famous six degrees of separation. But we can exploit then the topology of social media, for example, in this respect. We should build the scaled down networks characterized primarily by the meaning of the exchange rather than the quantity of the exchange signals, which is what we are basically doing most of the time at the moment. So this is six degrees of separation from the potential meaningful nodes should guide us toward the human capital that we want to cooperate with. What we should build then are human, I, I would like to define them as human mesh networks with interdependence among the people and the nodes. And that would preserve multiple potential layers of application and collectivity with a reciprocal trust and dependency, a negotiable relationship and an infinite possibility of reshape, rescale and reconfiguration. These mesh networks might provide a new strategy to nurture human relationship. So this interdependence and this, I mean, human mesh network refers to the, to the technical mesh networks, which are grassroots technical, uh, connective networks, but the human part is equally important. And again, this is something that we've tried to explore through the work that we have done in uh, Neural, and I'm going to explain how uh, um, in a minute. The first, let's, uh, I would like to mention a few uh, uh, inspiring uh, uh, well, first one and then later a few inspiring uh, practices and concepts that have led to what we have done over the years. The first is that uh, we uh, should explore also networks before 
the internet uh, became a public, exploded global infrastructure and what we might call a network ecology and the different network ecologies were already flourishing in what we now call the pre-internet times when alternative radical networks of communications were sharing the figure of the network. The network was a subject developing, were subjects developing their own networks within or outside predefined structures. Here there's a, uh, a picture which was elaborated by one of the father, one of the, uh, uh, I think, mostly precognitive um, uh, art movement during the 80s, the male art movement. Uh, um, Vittore Baroni, who is an Italian uh, artist, that is considered one of the um, uh, father of male art internationally, elaborated this picture just to enhance how we should start to think about connecting and creating our networks uh, beyond uh, what the technical limitations could be. This picture is from the 80s, of course. This was a particularly inspiring practice and it has been applied to develop what I call the interdependent networks of Neuro Magazine. Uh, let me start from the end. So uh, these are a couple of pictures from an exhibition at the beginning of this year. Uh, I mean, luckily we're just before the pandemic, so it could happen physically and it was quite uh, crowded. Uh, um, it was the uh, 25 plus one p piece uh, Nero 25 plus one uh, during the exhibition about the network during the Transmediale Festival in uh, Berlin. Nero has been possible over the years uh, thanks to these few networks of support, which are interdependent. And we show them in an installation celebrating the then 26 years of publishing. Each of the veterans you can see was showing one of all one of the networks that were supporting the magazine. So let me uh, start to exp uh, explain how that worked over the years, uh, starting with one, uh, um, with especially one practice. This is uh, an issue printed in 2008, uh, issue uh, 31. And uh, uh, after the, we, we already made uh, some attempts at the end of 90s through the magazine, but there's a particular work uh, that has uh, shown us how we could use the magazine and the networks around the magazine as a possible infrastructure to enhance a specific media artwork. Because of course, I mean, uh, uh, probably it, it, it's quite clear, but Nero has always been about uh, art, uh, uh, culture and technology, especially art and new media art uh, since the beginning, but from a critical point of view. So in this issue, we were um, including, with this issue, we were including an artwork and we were including it in order to distribute this artwork to our 500 subscribers. The artwork was called Notepad and was developed by a duo called Swamp. Uh, as you can see, the, the artwork is made by actually a, a, an apparently uh, common American style legal notepad classic American legal notepads, which have these yellow pages and a series of uh, um, um, black lines. And on the left, uh, to mark the margin, there are three red lines going from top uh, down. But this group uh, printed these notepads uh, with the one specific characteristics. They used uh, what is called the microprinting techniques to hide text into the different lines. So apparently there were normal lines, but they contain the text within. This text was readable only, as you can see in the picture, using a magnifying glass in order to read it, still with some difficulties. What kind of text they included? In 2008, they wanted to include the list 
of all the civilian casualties happened during the Iraqi war, which the uh, American government uh, denied that they ever happened. So they uh, printed within these lines all the data about the few hundred civilian uh, which were killed during the war. And then they took all the, uh, these notepads and shipped them to the White House. And there's a, a, a protocol that um, um, compellingly uh, force uh, what is received in that office uh, to be uh, registered and then uh, included, I mean, uh, bring uh, inside the space. So conceptually, what they were doing was to let the truth enter the institution that actually was denying it. But what we did with the magazine then, because we were supporting this action, we told, we told with the group, let's turn this uh, action into a perf collective performance. So they gave us 500 sheets of this work with a self-addressed envelope and, uh, instruct and the printed instructions, a, leaf, uh, a small uh, piece of paper with written instructions. So all the subscribers potentially could write a letter of protest and uh, ship this specific um, uh, this specific uh, sheet directly to the White House again turning what was a single artist action into a collective performance another uh, so what we were using was the infrastructure of the magazine in a way turning the subscribers into uh, not only audience, but an active part and a supportive part of, a, of an artwork performance. Another uh, intervention that I'm particularly keen about uh, has been the, uh, the Pirate Book, which is a book uh, edited by uh, two artists, Nicola Maigret and Maria Roshovska, uh, French and Polish artists, uh, and it's a particularly interesting book about uh, uh, contemporary forms of piracy, uh, ha which have happened all over the world, on internet as well as in particular countries like in Nigeria, in China, uh, and, and talk about piracy as a, a cultural phenomenon, especially driven uh, by the digital infrastructure. When they published the book, uh, we were thinking about how to support again this uh, cultural effort. And at the same time, a Slovenian institution, uh, Axioma, uh, was also organizing an exhibition of this duo and offered to um, uh, produce a USB drive, which you can see on the right, with whatever content we would have decided to put in. Uh, the first proposal was to put on the USB drive uh, the PDF of the book, obviously, and then distribute it again to our uh, subscribers. But then we started to have a more elaborated talk and say, okay, maybe we can uh, actually uh, do more than just a PDF because PDF can be easily downloadable through any uh, internet repository. And the discussion led to include in the USB drive all the possible um, files that were the research file, the working files to produce the book. So the whole content uh, repacked, as they said, uh, amounting to 5.15 gigabytes was included in the USB drive. But among this content, there were also uh, part and files which were actually quite controversial. Since they were talking about internet piracy, for example, one of these files was a bootleg uh, of a Led Zeppelin concert. And this file was uh, uh, the reason why Led Zeppelin took the BitTorrent company to the court in the United States, because they allowed this bootleg to be widely spread through the BitTorrent protocol. This file was included among the many other in this USB. And then the final 
uh, step of this collaboration happened. The artists uh, asked, actually commissioned uh, a, a lawyer's firm in Paris to analyze the content of the USB drive and then express uh, their opinion about if the USB drive was illegal, the content of the USB drive was illegal or not. This lawyer's firm then analyzed it and based on uh, the EUROs expressed a, a quite, uh, a, I mean, formulated a whole dossier of five pages, uh, basically saying, we think that the content is perfectly legal because all the files you are, um, uh, you are uh, saving, you are, which are present in the USB drive can be easily retrieved through uh, public channels on the internet. So what we did, was in the issue 53 in 2016. We put, we reprinted, we scanned and reprinted the page uh, of this dossier when it said that uh, uh, the USB is perfectly legal. And then as you can see, we stapled uh, the USB drive with all the files. This particular uh, uh, configuration again was shipped to our around, they are changing numbers of course, but around 500 subscribers. And uh, I will come back to that in a minute, uh, saying that among them, and this is another network of uh, support, among the 500 subscribers, 200 of them are libraries and most of them, the majority of them are academic libraries, uh, institutional libraries. We can think about them then, about these libraries of both a network, which is a preservation strategy of the, for the magazine, because the libraries are preserving, they are hosting what we might call backup copies uh, in distant places, among the libraries uh, who have the whole collection of Dura magazine, uh, I can mention the Museum of Modern Art Library in New York, or the MIT uh, Library uh, in Boston, and many others uh, spread uh, all over the world. They are not only a network which is preserving the magazine, but they are also, they become a distribution strategy for the artworks which are embedded within the magazine, even the controversial one. So it's a kind of a mutual exchange. They have the collection and you can, which can be consulted by students, professors, or uh, everybody that can access the library, but it becomes a, a preservation in both sense and the distribution infrastructure for us. This is one of the networks which I was mentioning in the beginning, supporting the magazine actively, which are, we are in a way using. And this is also um, uh, to connect with what we were saying in the beginning, uh, a, a design of a process that we have done over the years. But there are other networks, of course, uh, uh, supporting the magazine. There's the network of the outlets stocking the magazine, which is a different one. Uh, there are mostly independent outlets stocking the magazines. Uh, for the record, there is uh, even one, uh, not even, but there is one in uh, Istanbul at the moment. Um, and then we can talk about the network of private subscribers, uh, who, which is supporting the magazine, and the network of advertisers, uh, and further vital ones for the project, providing economic support uh, rather than relying on public funding. This is something that I would like also to mention because I think it's important. The New York Magazine in 27 years of history has received the total amount of public funding of exactly zero euro cent. Not because we don't like public funding. We think that public funding is an essential tool for the development of independent culture and culture in general. But we started without it, uh, seeing if we could make uh, a, a cultural niche magazine that could be sustainable for the market. And in 27 years, we can say we succeeded at least for this aspect. But again, not just uh, trying to produce the best quality, 
within the magazine, which is our aim for every single issue, but also making designing processes that support the production of this magazine. And we humbly think that this configuration of processes can be applied also to possibly to other magazines and to other processes as well. There's uh, the last supportive uh, uh, network which I want to talk about, which I think is particularly important because it allowed us to um, extend the magazine towards other projects as well, which is the Neuro Archive, which leads to the uh, temporary libraries, which I'll, I will talk about uh, uh, in a few minutes. The Neuro Archive, uh, you can see it uh, in a picture from uh, eight years ago, but uh, later you will see it live, at least a, a piece of it, a small part of it uh, uh, behind my back. But uh, uh, the Neuro Archive is another of these processes uh, which is uh, collectively done. Actually, it has been firstly spontaneously done by just collecting the printed publications that we were receiving as a magazine, either because uh, people uh, were sending, publishers were sending them uh, in the hope to be uh, reviewed, or just catalogs uh, or artist publications or magazines, sometimes just to let us know what uh, artists and institutions were doing. And we have carefully collected all of them. But years after years, we have accumulated a quite specific and I would argue even a quite culturally valuable collection. I think it's one of the um, most important small collections of publications about the media art in general. But again, it was a generous donation which was made by the collectivity towards the magazine. It was something that we received as a generous gift by the collectivity. So I, at some point, it became also physically quite preponderant. And I started to think, okay, what we can do to give something back to this community. And the simple thing, the simple gesture that we have done and we are doing during these years uh, is the uh, New Archive website. So what we started to do is simply to scan the covers of uh, possibly everything that we have. So far, we have reached uh, almost 1,700 publications in this database. And it's just a catalog of what we have. So there is, uh, um, let me show you one record of a uh, quite rare book. Uh, it's a catalog of every publication. There are the bibliographical uh, details, as you can see, and the index. Actually, the index is a bit controversial because it can be seen as a um, violation of uh, uh, copyright, but it's just the index. We don't associate any PDF file unless the publishers uh, clearly uh, wants us to do that. Um, but the index is very important because it allows the visitors of the New York Archive, mostly scholars at the moment, to search through the publications. So you can, for example, search for a particular artist and you can come up uh, seeing not only where these artists has published a text, but possibly also in the catalogs of exhibitions he was part of. So. Again, uh, this is, we, we think about it as a resource. It's all we can actually do because we are not able to establish a physical public, public library uh, to make it available, maybe in the future. But at the moment, at least it's content, it's searchable. So even the existence of the, some of these books uh, is our, con I mean, acknowledging the existence and sharing the basic data. It's uh, our small effort to return the generosity of the community uh, that has donated all these books over the years. This is, for example, I, I mentioned this book because there's a nice uh, story uh, which can be told in, in a minute. Uh, 
basically it, it's an early uh, book about art and the networks. It's called Art and Communication. It's about experiments uh, made in Austria. Uh, and it was published in 1984 when I asked the institution, uh, the Austrian institution, if they still had a copy. They said, look, I, I think it's sold out since ages, but let me have a look. And then they found out a forgotten box at the end of their warehouse, full of these books, actually 40 copies. And they gladly wanted to donate one to us because they thought that it was a good effort. And again, it was generosity on one side, but it triggered another interesting process for me because then these 40 copies were started to be donated to other libraries and institutions, again, in a collaborative effort. So the Neuro Archive is meant to be a distributed archive also. And by that, uh, I briefly mean that it should be uh, distributed in order that uh, there should be other archives, uh, other online catalogs like the Neuro uh, one, and we should share our content and make it searchable together. This is my concept of distributed archive. At the moment, I'm trying to develop it with a, a couple of institutional, other institutional libraries. It's not easy because of the, the, the, uh, the, the technical sharing of metadata, but we are still working on it. And these distributed archives are meant to be polycentric systems. So systems that have different centers and all the centers have equal importance. And this to me reminds again of the network the structure. And let's then uh, uh, switch to the last topic of this talk, which is the temporary libraries. Let me again share a couple of inspiring sources uh, for what we, I personally have developed it together with other people and called temporary libraries. The first concept, it's the, what I call the liminal librarianship. <clears throat> Actually, uh, it's a very uh, simply and effectively explained right uh, from a, um, a, a remarkable uh, effort that has happened in Ankara in Turkey. Uh, this effort has been made by the uh, garbage collectors of a, a specific zone of the Turkish capital, who have started spontaneously to collect all the books and publications, uh, magazines, journals, uh, uh, that have been just thrashed uh, by the people, they have started to collect them, clean them, and then make them available in a room that they that was not used before. Uh, it's quite important that this resource have been created from nothing, actually from what have been discarded and would have been ended into the landfill. And they have been able to collect 25,000 books, which have become again, a common, a public resource, which is uh, uh, enjoyable for free uh, if you go there and just uh, um, pick up a book and consult it. This is what I call the liminal uh, librarianship because it's, in the, it's taking the liminal territories of, of publications that are somewhere and are not used and it's bringing them to where they should be used. There's another important concept for the temporary library, which is the so-called book mobile. This is a picture from the 30s in US. Uh, and the, the, the book mobile is a very simple concept. It's about bringing the books when they are needed. The libraries, public libraries, were um, taking uh, a, a means of transportation, filling it with books and bring the books, usually in rural, areas, in areas where there was no library and was distant from uh, the, the, the cultural centers in order to let them access the culture that the library was hosting and preserving. So this is uh, this uh, uh, concept uh, has been uh, uh, explored since the end of 19th century, but this is a quite uh, early application. 
as you can see. It has been explored all over the world. Yesterday, I was able to find a picture from the 70s, again from Ankara. Uh, you will pardon me for my uh, very non-existent uh, pronunciation of uh, uh, Turkish language. Uh, I found out that it was uh, called Gezishi uh, uh, or book mobile. So uh, also the, the, the, the Turkish National Library was using the same concept, uh, filling buses and bringing them uh, to uh, mostly to the countryside or to where minorities were in order to share the culture uh, and uh, that was uh, uh, hosted at the National Library. Again, here we have uh, to bring the books when they are needed, ideally breaking the walls of the libraries. Again, the libraries, I, can, I consider the libraries as a fundamental uh, institutions to, um, uh, to support culture. Uh, but most of the time, they are kind of monumental institutions that you have to go to unless they have online access instead of having a circulation of the libraries outside. These two, these different factors have inspired the temporary library project. This is the picture from the very first one, uh, but let me explain uh, first how it works. So the concept of the temporary library is to uh, uh, make, uh, uh, I mean, to, is to make a temporary library for an event. Of course, as a, a long experience, uh, with a long experience uh, with a magazine, I'm particularly interested in new media art. So I was looking for events, festivals, dealing with new media art. And the idea was to team up with another person or uh, another uh, or a team of person in order to co-curate a list of publications and then ask them, uh, ask for donations of these publications in order to make this the library, which would have been temporary because would have been publicly available during the event. The first one we have made uh, has been for Transmedia Festival again in uh, uh, Berlin in 2017. And I co curated it with Annette Gilbert, who is um, an expert in artist books uh, in the, and, and a Berliner. The festival was celebrating 30 years of publishing. So uh, we wanted to reflect it into the temporary library. What we did then was to explore not only the publications directly coming out from the festival, but all the efforts that in a way stemmed from the festival, which could have been, um, which could have been judged as strictly related to the festival. Uh, th this whole outcome uh, was tried to be explored and we uh, asked for 200 books donations and we got 170 which were available during uh, the festival, I may very humbly say that it was quite a success because the, the, the library was always crowded. There were tables so people could just take a book, sit down and read it. Or, and there were di nice dynamics that started to, to happen, which now uh, uh, we, we can be a bit nostalgic about of people who just started to talk with the person uh, next to him or her in order to have an opinion about what the content of the book, so also social dynamics of sharing around the library. But there are another two steps which are important for the temporary library concept. One is that we were including also a, a leaflet with the list of all the books which were donated. Not only uh, the, the very essential um, uh, data about these books, but also who donated them so the publisher or who actually was donating them in order to establish a contact between the donors and the, uh, the readers who, can, who potentially uh, became uh, also customers of the publishers as well, uh, making a, a, a possible short circuit between this uh, um, uh, free uh, enjoyment of the publications and uh, cultural and productive dynamics behind it. And the other very important uh, step of the 
temporary library. The other, very, the other very important element is that the temporary libraries, once the event, once the event is finished, are donated to an institutional library. So the ones made for Transmediale was donated to the UDK, which is the Universitat des Kunste in Berlin, which is probably the, the, the most important university of art in the, in, in the city and probably among the most important in Germany. And the librarian was so enthusiastic to uh, receive this donation, again, a free donation, uh, that uh, decided also to make an exhibition, to exhibit the whole uh, uh, special collection before cataloging it and acquiring it definitely. Spe I, I mentioned it was a special collection and that's also important because we asked the libraries then to acquire it as a special collection. Why? Because it has to be a temporary library. So it has to have a, a definitive uh, uh, reliable host, in this case, uh, the UDK library. But if another event in the future would ask for the temporary library in order to host it during the temporary, during the event, the library should at least um, uh, be open to enter a, a discussion with, a dialogue with them to negotiate a possible lending of this special collection to the event and back. That's the full concept of the temporary library. And it worked quite well, I have to say. Briefly and uh, uh, quickly, we have the uh, second temporary library uh, in, uh, made in Latin America uh, for the ICEA 2017 uh, conference uh, in uh, Manizales in Colombia, which was co-curated with Andres Burbano. A third one was made during the XCOX conference in Lisbon, uh, the temporary libraries of Portuguese new media art, co-curated with Luis Arribas and Miguel Carvalhais. Here, another step was accomplished because the students of the University of Lisbon uh, were involved in the process. So they devised, as you can see in the picture, the shelves, which are reconfigurable shelves, uh, and they are made in a, in a complete sustainable way. They are made for recycled wood and uh, in a way that can be reconfigured at will. And they also wanted to reflect it in the small catalog uh, that was printed. The small catalog was using a small software that allowed to a, a remix of the list of books every time the catalog was printed. So every time it was printed had a different uh, order of the books inside, which was reflecting the shelves, um, uh, which were obviously printed. So these archival experiments were meant to collect, to evolve collectively over time. Again, they are not meant to be my own single work, but uh, uh, um, as a, a collective experiment. The subsequent one was made in Trondheim in Norway. It was the temporary library of Norwegian media art made during the Metamorph uh, um, Biennial in 2018 and was co-curated with Zane Zerpinja and Stahl Stensley. Again here, the students were involved and uh, we had a week of a temporary laboratory with the kit, which was, is the University of Art there, uh, co-conceived with Michel Terran and uh, they, they were producing art books uh, uh, after consulting and criticizing the collection that we assembled. But interestingly, uh, I managed to have the students in Trondheim to have a Skype of a few hours with the students in Lisbon in order to exchange the experience and ideas. And again, this is pushing the collective evolution of the project. The last one has been made in, uh, for now, has been made in uh, uh, Berlin again, and is the temporary library for creating commons. Uh, in 2019, it was co-curated with Cornelia Solfrank, Felix Stalder, and Shusha Niederberg. But I, uh, the, the, the, the, the mo one of the most beautiful outcome is that what I was mentioning before, so that an event could have asked for the library 
for a, a short amount of time actually happened. And two libraries were able to move somewhere else. The Library of Portuguese New Media Art was moving to the Biennale, uh, to, the, to the Biennale de Arte Contemporanea de Maya in 2019, and then went back to Lisbon. And the Temporary Library of Norwegian Media Art uh, moved to Oslo and to the Foreign Conference again in 2019. And here, a second call was made and more books were collected. So the temporary library moved from Trondheim and when it moved back, it had 40 new titles added. Again, this process is made, is based on creating a collective uh, public resource with basically no budget uh, from the beginning, based on the processes that can be triggered, on the generosity that can be also uh, in a way triggered, and on the self-awareness of an artist scene, but also then on creating this common, this public resource, basically from nothing, but that then can be a stable resource uh, for all the people that can possibly enjoy it, and uh, can also move around when it's needed. And that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, I, I was uh, thinking that one of the biggest uh, luck uh, in this uh, online uh, talks uh, and conferences is that uh, the, the audience uh, might applaud and we might not know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so that's the uh, that's the thing well thank you thank you so much I think we touched um, a lot really uh, of um, points uh, that might be uh, even further explore um, I don't know how are we uh, doing with the uh, time in that sense but definitely we have uh, Q and A. So I invite the um, participant to um, suggest some uh, question. I haven't uh, received yet uh, anything. Maybe we can just. Um, I mean, I'm solicitating so that they might uh, do. Meanwhile, I, I can say something since also you mentioned uh, about uh, Miguel Carvajal. Uh, that he's going to be part of the uh, talk uh, during these days as well. Um, let me check again for the date before I say something uh, incorrect. So it's going to be at uh, 5 o'clock on the 18th, uh, meaning in uh, this uh, Friday at five, moderated by uh, Raul Pinto, in the, that uh, series of talk that I was referring to as uh, Mediterranean uh, Network. Uh, so that is also uh, a, a circle that uh, closes. So again, like the network uh, active in a certain way. Uh, so people that uh, are uh, somehow uh, connected. Um, okay, so there are uh, comment. Okay, I have a comment. So yeah, uh, the uh, interpreter, the translator is uh, suggesting uh, something uh, actually. So uh, he says that in the 90s in Turkey, uh, progressive students were opening book tables in school canteens. Uh, so somehow they were creating um, temporary uh, libraries uh, themselves. Uh, so that practice that extends uh, in, in other uh, way. So I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there have been uh, quite a few examples of uh, uh, sharing publications uh, uh, in, a, in a way or another. Again, that's why I was mentioning, we can date them back even uh, more than a century. Uh, in a structured way, but probably can even find them uh, even before. Uh, the, uh, for me, the point is uh, 
uh, as I might guess, it was probably for the students uh, to share specific uh, bunch of knowledge, uh, which can, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, I, mean, I, I would uh, uh, connect again with what uh, Valero was saying in the beginning about the collaborative uh, potential effort and how can they can be extremely beneficial, which again crosses the network concept. Um, I think that there's a, a, a lot of potential in the uh, in in in the opportunities that can be created and and we are surrounded constantly surrounded by opportunities through all the information uh, that is uh, coming to us it is almost jumping onto us all the time but we are overwhelmed probably by a too, a, a, a, too, a, a huge amount of information and the problem is sorting it out this was easier uh, before the internet, before social media, and it was even easier probably before the internet. And I'm not nostalgic about that. I'm just saying that we should just learn how to establish proper processes that would enable a meaningful exchange. Uh, and I think that these progressive students, which were opening book tables, uh, I, th there were uh, similar processes uh, during the 70s uh, in Italy as well, uh, in the Italian, free, uh, among Italian progressive students. Uh, they were uh, giving the opportunity to exchange a meaningful knowledge, a specific one, among people who are, who are interested in that. So not having a big thing, not having necessarily a million books, but just those that might be interesting for that specific community. And interesting means that they can uh, create opportunities because they can share ideas and th these ideas can create further opportunities uh, starting from that. Um, one thing that fascinates uh, me, uh, uh, thanks, by the way. Um, one thing that fascinates me is also the, uh, the physicality of this uh, library. I mean, like the fact that, uh, as you said, uh, the need of being uh, specific, the need to be built in a community, and then the role of networks of just actually extending the community and bring together, as you showed us, uh, communities of different places uh, that they are building uh, libraries. So, um that's that's a nice um i think it's very important how i mean i think in all the uh work that you showed us today uh there is this uh treating uh procedural uh aspect in a uh, without the machine uh, i mean like you you your work about the process of how to make things how to share things um beyond the limit i mean using the uh technology but also and especially uh focusing on the social dynamics of sharing uh as you as you mentioned um and like creating really networks of people above networks of uh technology so i think that this overlapping and this movement it's it's very crucial it's very uh it, it makes the work very uh Interesting. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think that uh, it's quite important that there's, uh, uh, that's why I was mentioning the, the human mesh networks in the beginning, that yeah. in any way, uh, we have a, an incredible technical infrastructure that can benefit this process enormously. The point is using it uh, in a way that um, empower, um, enable these processes instead and so uh, let us think uh, let us switch uh, let's say the perspective from thinking about us and how many followers we have and how much we are gratified uh, by other people's attention to build some attention together with other people and make bigger uh, processes and bigger projects and not necessarily bigger but more just more meaningful uh, for us that we couldn't do uh, 
uh, alone. I mean, again, the, the library you can see on, on, on my back, which is a piece of the neural archive. I mean, I, I couldn't have made it uh, in, a, in a million years alone. I wouldn't have had uh, the, the, the, the, the knowledge, uh, the, the, the, the, the support, uh, probably also the, the, the proper, uh, I mean, funding time and the rest to do it. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, the, the using, exploiting the networks, the technical networks, uh, in order to enable these processes. Uh, and I think that designing them in a specific way, uh, it's also extremely important to make them work. I think there's a, a yes, yes, I was, I was going a to question. tell you exactly. I would like to. Um elaborate more on uh, empowering and criticality, uh, but we have some questions, so let's jump to uh, that first. Um, so first question um, from Janetska Nuxel, uh, she says, what would be a uh, possible motivation of participant to this event from your lens? Uh, so have you ever surveyed or observed? So like um, more like, yeah, observation about the people that uh, participate and what can be the, uh, their um, aims. Uh, so observing, just reading, meeting new people. Uh, and further, second question, what would be the barriers uh, in this event uh, if we ever would like to start to do one like this? And I think that is uh, a um, will that uh, I personally already expressed, but I think uh, here in Izmir we might uh, like to uh, go in that direction as soon as the condition allows. Uh, yeah, the answer to the first part uh, is that uh, usually, uh, I mean, um, uh, in, in all the examples I've shown, we were into uh, a, a, a system which was a, basically a festival, a conference, or um, already a crowded event, or anyway with uh, uh, enough people, uh, and the library was uh, a, a, a, an opportunity uh, to expand uh, the knowledge that was already circulating there. It, it, I think it was important that it was a, a curated library, so that it was not just collecting everything, but to make a, a meaningful selection with some um, uh, specific uh, uh, aim. So reflecting like for Transmedia, reflecting the history or in, I could elaborate about other uh, examples uh, in the case of the common uh, or creative common, um, creating commons exhibition was to uh, reflect the same concept of common through the selection that we made. Um, so the motivation was, and, and usually we ask that the library is in a place where people just pass through. So they just, they should just almost stumble upon it or, or face it. And uh, uh, in this uh, respect, uh, it's quite easy to be involved, especially if there's somebody else already that you are curious. I mean, you see the covers and they are there, they are freely. Uh, readable, so why not having a look? And it's then that the dynamics can start because you can find something that in those books that can be useful for your research, for your interest. Again, the opportunities, the opportunities that are inside these publications. Uh, as an academic researcher, I mean, I know it very well, but I think it's a concept that can be applied to basically anybody uh, in every possible uh, uh, cultural or non-cultural domain. So it's an opportunity and, and when you recognize it, so you see uh, an artwork that you, it's interesting for you or maybe it, it, it's, it's something that, that, that, I mean, triggers your interest. And then you start, uh, as the students were doing in uh, uh, Berlin in the first time, to take your smartphone and take pictures from these books because you, you, you want to carry this information with you. And if you find somebody else, maybe somebody you know, then it starts this uh, social dynamic that I think it was very fruitful. Uh, I never technically surveyed it because I, I, I have just observed them uh, from 
distance. And uh, what happened in, uh, in Berlin was just beautiful because it was a kind of word of mouth. Uh, we opened in, on Friday and on Sunday there were lots of students which were basically squatting all the tables because they could find materials that probably they wouldn't be able to find in their own library. Uh, that, that was, uh, I think, the point. And uh, beyond that, uh, one of the questions that started to arise was, okay, where can I buy it? Which is an interesting uh, question for me. It's not uh, blasphemous at all, the opposite. It's okay, I gave the opportunity, uh, not, not me, but the system gave the opportunity to discover new products, new things, new cultural products. And then somebody done, that want to, uh, to, to buy this product because eventually it can be important for whatever reason. That's why we produce the, all the time the list with the, with the donors, because there they could get in touch with the producers. And I was thinking that if, uh, unfortunately in 2017, there was no bookstore in Transmedia, but if we would have arranged with at least with the publishers to have the books also in the bookstore, mm -hmm. that would be a quite fruitful process. Because I mean, uh, it, it would have been not as a kind of vitrine with the products like, okay, we just expose them. Because, again, because it was a curated selection. And so there was a specific concept. So the, it was a highlighted at, at, at the next level of a possible victory. And again, I like these two dimensions when there's uh, an economic uh, trajectory that uh, allows to uh, uh, produce these objects. So the publishers on one side and on the other, we can have a common where these objects are anyway available. So I like to think that the, the, the public one creates the opportunity to discover and also to support the uh, uh, business one, if you want, and the other way around, and the business support the discovery through the public resource. For the second one, uh, the barriers for this event. Well, at the moment, as you were mentioning, uh, it, it's quite hard even to think about something like that. There were a few talks to make more, uh, but we obviously had to stop because it would make sense to facilitate uh, uh, infections, uh, uh, saying people to be uh, one next to the other. Still, I'm, uh, I'm often thinking that uh, uh, th there are a few uh, processes that we should preserve and find a way to uh, even uh, structure them uh, in a digital way, uh, if we will not be able to do them uh, physically for a, a bit of time. I, I, I, I'm trying to be as optimistic as possible, so I hope that there will be soon again an opportunity. Uh, but again, uh, it's also important, I, I think that the concept has to be preserved more than the, uh, the, the implementation. Okay, there is no more question. There is a, a lot actually I would add and I would like to you know, uh, ask you uh, further, uh, especially regarding I mean, like another aspect that I would have liked to explore is as you said, like the, um, also the, the, the common produced by creating these uh, uh, temporary libraries. I mean, like uh, in one case you had a list then uh, the catalog, then, you know, like it's also generating new um, objects as well that are a tool in the end for uh, people to discover the books, to extend their knowledge, and the fact that it is curated, it is a way of discerning uh, on the immensity of the, uh, the web that you uh, mentioned uh, as well. So I think there is really a lot of depth and a lot of potentialities in the end uh, as a practice of uh, creating commons, uh, of, as a practice of uh, creating sociality. And yeah, I mean, uh, after, let's say, 
uh, whatever uh, is going to be uh, the uh, let's say conclusion of the pandemic as it is. Uh, so that that will also I mean reopen uh, with other possibilities. Uh, I, and I hope uh, yes we will explore that uh, in the in the city in, in, in, I mean within the physicality of the uh, of the place. There, there's one other last aspect I wanted to underline as well, which mm -hmm. I didn't mention before. Uh, when the uh, collection, the special collection is donated to the library, basically not only its maintenance, but also its expansion, mm -hmm. it's handed out to the librarian. So I'm, I, I'm, uh, the, the curators of the list are not anymore uh, uh, owners uh, uh, of the concept, it's handed to them. So uh, I think that this is also an important uh, aspect because uh, the creation of the uh, specialized resource for a, a, a, an infra a common infrastructure, in a way, so what I mean is that it stemmed uh, from, uh, I mean, I, I've traveled a lot uh, lecturing uh, in, in a lot of different places. And when I was in institutions, I was checking the new media art section in the art uh, institutional library. And the new media art is usually quite depressing. There's very little uh, bit of it, or, or there's quite confusion, like there's an AutoCAD manual next to a theoretical uh, uh, essay. So this expertise, this is my, my point, sharing this expertise and creating a little bit of this expertise with the librarian, donating it, more than donating because it's not us donating, it's those who provide the books who are donating. So just channeling, that's why I'm talking, I'm speaking about the design of a process. Designing this process in a way that a surplus from the publisher goes to the library in a, in a uh, contextualized way with some expertise in between. It's a process that I think it's, uh, I think it's a very happy process. It's very beneficial because it can be done to reinforce the libraries in a way, to create the libraries as well, uh, which can benefit from the expertise of other people uh, uh, on the other side somehow. So we can have, uh, um, we can ideally have uh, uh, wonderful libraries uh, with contributions that then are nurtured by those who are already doing it there, which are the, libra who are the librarians. I think this is also a, a, a social process that it's worth to mention somehow. Yeah, because like then the curator, uh, you and who, uh, work with you, become the initiator in the end of the process, uh, but then exactly it, it, it works on its own uh, through, the, um, through the library and also through the event as you showed us. Uh, going in Norway, it enriched of a series of volumes, so like that is also another uh, way of creating the common future of uh, that uh, temporary uh, library. So, yes. I don't see any more questions. I have, I have a question, if I, if I may. Valerio. Valerio if I may. Also. Sure. I would like to, to ask um, your opinion, Alessandro, how this pandemic is uh, also forcing the library to, to, to think about uh, its future. I mean, in case uh, uh, physical spaces for a while cannot be uh, filled with people. And um, so how it can be evolve if I are, I mean, if you're already working uh, on this uh, in a in a future where uh, just an external factor cannot uh, put us together physically as now the, the event is taking place on zoom but uh, for uh, for the library are you are you thinking about this or Yes, thank you very much for the question, uh, Valerio. Actually, yes, I, I, I'm qu dedicating quite a bit of time uh, to rethinking the library also as a whole uh, for for my on my research. And uh, yes, I have quite a, a few ideas. I have to say that car that in the last few years there have been quite a few experiments on how to design a library. 
uh, that is extending the classic idea of having a collection of uh, uh, lendable, borrowable books to different other fields and dynamics. As you mentioned, the pandemic is posing serious uh, uh, threats to uh, still uh, consulting library or being present in a library in a classic way. Um, I can mention the library at the university, uh, the, the university I'm part of, uh, the Winchester School of Art, they had to, uh, they, it, it was open. Uh, I think it's still open now, but they have to adopt a lot of uh, procedures, technical procedures in order to um, uh, have people and, uh, using it in a safe way. In a way, if you want uh, uh, um, diminishing most of the potential, because of course, if you just touch a book, you have to leave it and it will not be available for a few days because it has to go through the whole procedure of disinfection and stuff like that. So it was a big effort by them in order to still uh, support the students uh, and uh, the staff, but at a quite high price. So uh, it, there's of course the digital dimension of libraries and we have wonderful digital libraries and all the major libraries uh, national libraries are also thinking about their own digital presence and strategies i had a chat with uh, uh, some uh, with the people running the lab uh, at the british library and they are also uh, into a few trajectories uh, the, i think that uh, there's uh, there are a couple of elements to be considered mainly. One is the role of digital. Uh, in this moment, uh, access to digital resources is absolutely fundamental uh, because of our condition. And if this condition will persist for quite a while, or will, I mean, will, if not under these conditions, as we all hope, but is still be present, we have to acknowledge that the digital access of resources will be a very important uh, right for everybody. But at the same time, we should not forget, I think, that the, uh, the dynamics that should be created because uh, the, the digital infrastructure has been built technically, uh, focusing on uh, mostly on the single user accessing as much as possible. I mean, the collaborative tools in, in, in business have started to be uh, uh, spread only in the last few years because of the different dynamics that business have started to face. So when it comes to libraries, uh, to answer your question uh, in a, uh, fully, I hope, is that uh, we should think in these three, uh, I mean, in these in, in this two directions. One is that the libraries are an asset, a capital a social capital that we have, which is constituted by the resource and the librarians. You should absolutely not forget that. And uh, the space is also a, a, a, a very important resource. So when we don't have any more the physical space, I think that we should start thinking in terms of creating dynamics online that should reflect the dynamics that happened in the space rather than just focusing on the access to the resources. So what I mean is, it's not only that I should have all the books or the publications available and the librarian's expertise is uh, eventually available too. It should also be that I should contribute to it in a way in different possible ways as a user. It should also be that uh, we should create some virtual spaces if they will be needed that would reflect the uh, library dynamics too. It should also be that we could possibly expand again as it, it has been experimented in the last few years, the library as a concept not strictly connected to the books but also to other practices to basically the exchange of knowledge, because I think that libraries are essentially about that. 
it's the knowledge that I got from the books, but it's also knowledge I got from the librarians. It's the knowledge that I can get from other people who share my interests, I can get in touch with. So this exchange of knowledge, which I do think it's essential for our common futures, let me uh, aside again the, the topic, uh, should be reproduced in the digital dynamics of access libraries until it will be uh, hopefully soon uh, possible again to recreate them physically. Also because, and I won't elaborate too much on that, uh, uh, it's not just a question of feeling better when we access them, access this thing physically. It's also a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot, there's a, a, a much wider exchange of knowledge and signals that we have when we are physically present. Uh, so we are anyway going to lose something when we switch from the physical to the digital, but we can gain something else. And again, I think that the social aspect and the cultural aspect should be our first focus rather than the mere technical one. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are lightly over time, but we also started a bit late. I see it appearing, uh, so probably she's going to um, call us for time, let's say. So thank you. Thank you again so much, Alessandro. I think it was um, really wonderful to hear this process and to include it uh, in the uh, catalog of uh, this talks of these days of Good Design uh, Izmir. Thank you to the council again. I'm gonna leave the word to Elif, I think. Uh, uh, well, point. thank you so much. I think this was a very, I mean, in this, how can I say, it's a really filling a gap in the program. That's uh, how I uh, feel. And uh, it, was, it was really uh, interesting in that sense, contributing. I'm very happy uh, for this, um, keynote speech and uh, I'm hoping and it will be I know that uh, we will also promote in the YouTube channel and it will be more visible and uh, we are already uh, sending um, our um, wishes to the people right now and um, I want to thank you uh, for everybody again and I really hope uh, we can welcome you here uh, uh, Alessandro, that would be really nice to see you uh, in Izmir. I just would like to remind uh, tomorrow uh, at tomorrow's speech, and I, I'll say it in Turkish, sorry. Yarınki oturumumuzu ben iletmek istiyorum. Ege Giyim Sanayicileri Derneği'nin hazırladığı bir panelimiz var. Panelimizin adı Müşterek geleceğimiz için sürdürülebilir moda. Ee, Nurgül Şahin yürütecek. Konuşmacılarımız Erdal Güvenç, İrem Yampar Coştan, Sibel Bozcakurt ve tabii ki Şelen Küpöz olacak. Sizleri e, yarın da bekliyoruz. Well, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you soon in İzmir. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Thanks for thank having me here. Thank you all. Thank you all.